Evans and our guests. Should I <laughs> So welcome uh, to this space uh, for our great debate. And uh, we are excited today to um, just witness and participate in this momentous occasion at the DC Department of Corrections. Um, and just the awesome, awesome partnership that we have. So I will turn it over to um, Ms. Burnett, the Administrator for Education, and then our very great partner over here, Judge Peru. Good afternoon. Welcome back to that Welcome again. Before we get started, I just want to um, thank a few people who have been instrumental in launching this debate today. And then I will pass it over to Judge Ruby to launch. So uh, before we get started, I want to first say thank you to uh, National Prison Debate League and all of their colleagues who have made this possible today. Thank you so much to the instructors that have showed up every week to really work with our students, prepare our students to win today. So thank you. And I want to give a big shout out to Mr. McCready, who also works tirelessly to ensure the walk. <laughs> All the hard work he does to make everything possible for classes each week. And then I would like to thank you, Judge, for uh, really pioneering this partnership. This started about a year ago. We're so thankful for everybody that has been a part of it. And I will turn it over to you. One of the debaters on our clock. It's a good to talk fast. So I'll be quick. Uh, so we're going to hand off the microphone here to Daniel in a second, uh, who will be uh, moderating today's debate. Uh, I see people working on the screen there, so we'll be there. Uh, okay, so really excited to have everyone here. So now I'm Judge Murphy. I'm down at the DC District Court as a magistrate judge there. Uh, I got into this program because of what debate has meant to me. I was a policy debater, not like these folks. When I was at Georgetown, there was the A team. I was like the I forgot the alpha team. Uh, I was carrying the box of the like these folks here. Uh, and so, the debate was really important to me. It was a way to learn to speak for myself, uh, sort of communicate in what it felt like in the foreign world. Uh, my parents were immigrants who came here. My mom went to community college. And I, uh, I just didn't know a lot of stuff I was doing. And debate became an access point to this whole new world. And you see debaters now, policy debaters, and we're policy debaters. And we are all the debaters beneath us. We are the apex predators of the uh, Sorry, I guess the coaches were not policy but, uh, <laughs> These policy debaters everywhere in all spheres of life and are really doing amazing things. And that's because they teach you how to advocate for yourself, speak for yourself. And we talked about this. Daniel said when we came in here, we had our first session. We had some great debaters go throughout uh, and to get you all interested, uh, which is so important. That you all have learned that you have to advocate yourself, speak for yourself. Uh, and this is just giving you the tool, right? The practice. It's like you can go tackle somebody, but you need to learn how to tackle them the right way if you want to be a professional athlete. Uh, I'm very, very grateful, not only to Jason, but to have Deputy Director Williams, I mean, the entire DOC staff. This is one of the first times in the country that a debate like this has happened. And you're with a team that just came back from the national championship. Uh, and so it's extraordinary. It's a real credit to the DC Department of Corrections to make this happen. We are so grateful from both sides, from the Georgetown side of my family, to the DOC side, uh, for you all taking this chance. Because anytime things like this are risk, and it takes courage uh, to look in the face of risk and do things with compassion and care that they do here. So, so appreciative. I'm very appreciative for our guest judges, who I know Daniel's been introduced. Uh, but especially uh, great for my colleague, uh, Judge Frieder, uh, from the District Court being here. We are so excited to see what's going to happen today. And I'll, even though, I'll, I'll close up prayer to Daniel, even though I'm a Georgetown alum, Georgetown supporter, I teach at the university, I told him yesterday what my son said when he first got in the fast car at Tesla, and we were racing some people. And he said, I said, what should we do? He said, Father, let's smoke those fools. <laughs> so I'm just telling you guys here right now, DOC, let's smoke those fools. <laughs> Well, again, how's your audio? Can you check? 
Yeah, no, thank you for that introduction and obviously a lot of people to recognize. So thank you for acknowledging uh, so many people who make an event like this possible behind the scenes and that you're going to see before you today. My name is Daniel Troop. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Prison Debate League. We believe in decarcerating minds, building bridges, and amplifying the voices of incarcerated intellectuals so that we can all have important conversations about policies that tend to disproportionately uh, impact uh, folks uh, from the communities who aren't always included in these conversations about positive policy change. So policy debate is very uh, important as a platform for all people to understand differences and perspectives that aren't your own, but that can enrich your own. And we love at the NPDL being able to bring together different communities of practice into these very unique spaces to have uh, intelligent conversations about important issues. So in doing so, I, I am going to be your moderator today. And I also have a lot of folks to acknowledge. Um, but I would like to begin by saying Thank you all for, for joining today, both in person for those who are in DC on site and everyone who's tuning in virtually from across the country and perhaps internationally as we also have international ties. Uh, we'll be launching our first international team in Finland on May 2nd uh, against Binghamton University on a, on a very important policy topic about the US considering the adoption of the open prison model that Europe has. So May 2nd, I hope everyone will tune in for that as well. But today we are here and we are going to acknowledge the two amazing debate teams you're about to be introduced to and see in action. And I think as, as we always say about our teams, the intellectual ability on display on such a high, highly complex policy topic is, these folks may make it look easy, but uh, it, it's not. And we're all gonna learn a ton today. Uh, these amazing teams from Georgetown University, the Hoyas, and our co-ed team, our newest NPDL franchise that we're proud to launch is a co-ed team here from DC called the Defense Coalition. And they're convening for a policy debate on the following resolution. Resolved, the United States should guarantee universal voting rights to all of its citizens, regardless of whether they have a, committed a crime. So we're, this is a debate about universal voting rights for all citizens. And the incarcerated intellectuals of the Defense Coalition team from DC will argue in the affirmative supporting this resolution, while the Georgetown University Hoyas argue in the negative position, refuting the affirmative case. Each debater will be judged upon the following criteria, analysis, reasoning, evidence, organization, refutation, and delivery. The five very distinguished judges of today's debate will be your chief judge, Jared Atchison, Professor and former director of debate at Sanford University, former president, oh, uh, oh excuse me, um, president of the American Forensic Association and also director of graduate studies at Wake Forest University. Jared will be our chief judge today, tallying the scores and announcing the winner at the end. Michaela Molson is the director of debate at Emory University. She's also the coach of the Copeland winner for the top ranked debate team in 2024 and the coach of the top speaker at the 2024 National Debate Tournament. So we're happy to have Michaela joining as well. Also on the panel, um, continuing this amazing panel of judges, Danielle O'Gorman. She's the director of debate at the United States Naval Academy and former president of the American Debate Association. Also joining on our panel is Maura Des Moines. She's the Associate Dean at Georgetown University Law School. And rounding out our panel and putting the, the judge in our guest judge is the Honorable Dabney Friedrich, uh, federal DC circuit judge. So those are your five judges and uh, give them a warm welcome. Coaching our teams, we have Brandon Kelly of the Georgetown Hoyas and we'll be introducing each speaker in turn, but the coaches, uh, we had a Brandon bringing in his Georgetown Hoya squad, uh, a top ranked squad, I might add, and coaching our NPDL team here in DC, we had a, uh, a pretty good uh, crew of volunteer coaches. And that was some of, some of the, um, the conversation around teamwork because we work as a team even to train our teams and it's always uh you know volunteer based so we're very grateful to our volunteer coaches and judges who make all of this possible 
Sarah Istel was one of our one of our coaches. Um, I know the team loves Sarah. She does a lot in her volunteer work. She's also the Deputy General Counsel and Senior Policy Advisor on Technology to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. And prior to that, Sarah served as the Deputy General Counsel for the impeachment team. And she's also uh, served as a visiting affiliate for the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and also has a background in debate at Harvard. Um, joining Sarah on this coaching team was uh, Jackson Eprenbach. Jackson was another uh, former Georgetown debater, and he's a current um, he's, he's currently a high powered DC attorney. So we have lots of legal representation here. Um, Tori is also, Tori Sieber, um, is also another one of our volunteer coaches. And I believe she's uh, clerking for Judge Faruqi. And um, she also helped coach the team this year. So we're very happy to have Tori, Sarah, and Jackson on this coaching staff. And rounding out that, uh, that, that introduction was also Aaron Barrett. Uh, Aaron Barrett was another volunteer coach for our NPDL team. So they had lots of support in trying to get ready for this debate. None of the, the debaters have any uh, collegiate or debate experience to my knowledge. So they've learned not just debate, but this policy subject in a matter of a 12 week uh, sort of uh, cohort that, that we put on. And so it's very, uh, we're very excited to have them represent on this issue. So with all of that said, as I, as I had announced earlier, I am your moderator. I will introduce our debaters individually and they will adhere to their specified time limits. A digital timer will be displayed on screen and speakers' microphones will be muted if they exceed their time limits. At the conclusion of the debate, our judges will tally up each team's cumulative point total to determine the winner of today's contest. With all of that being said, it's now time to expand our minds and actually start this debate. So, I'm proud to introduce for the pro team, the affirmative team's first speaker from the Defense Coalition for seven to nine minutes. They're making the team's first constructive argument. We have Ms. Shamika Hayes. And just so everyone's clear, your time will start at your first audible remark. Can you just do, we just want to do an audio check. Can you hear us okay? Can the judges online hear us? Do we need a microphone or no? Do you think you're okay? Uh, that help? Is that helping uh, in terms of the audio from the judges? Can you hear us any better? Just do that. The current state of voting is unacceptable. 48 states did not have the right to vote to those convicted of a felony. Of those 48, 14 restored the right only after people voted, and 11 did not the right forever. And 20, in the 2020 election, 5.17 million people were disenfranchised because of these laws, which represents nearly 2.3% of all voters. Therefore, we propose the following plan. The United States should guarantee the right to vote to all persons convicted of a crime, so long as they will otherwise be eligible to vote. People serving time in jail or prison will vote by absentee ballot in their own jurisdiction. The plan is a moral and practical necessity. First, the right to vote is an alien and fundamental and ensuring an equal society. As Eli Levine wrote in the Washington University Jurisprudence Review in 2009, Democratic governance theory is based upon full and active participation of society's membership. One person, one vote is more than a clever phrase. It's the cornerstone of justice and equality. Should a certain slice of society not vote or be deprived of the opportunity to cast a ballot, the democratic governing structure of society fails. If some citizens are precluded from representing their preferences, then those citizens will feel that the lawmaking structure purposely abandon them, and policy will not re reflect the true goal of society. The right to vote is the most important because it is protective of all other rights. Over history, the right has been expanded, first to men without property, then to African American men, then to women. We outlawed literacy tests, poll taxes, and extended the right to 18 year olds. The next step in that history is criminal disenfranchise. As Alyssa Robin wrote in the University of the District of Columbia Law Review in 2007, the right is both revered as sacred and feared. 
It is constantly under attack precisely because of the power it has. Since the enfranchisement of free slaves, the African American vote in particular has been viewed as a threat to dominant political forces. And in turn, significant efforts have been made to suppress that vote. Many barriers to African American suffrage have been struck down, but one substantial disenfranchised measure remains criminal disenfranchisement. The felon and ex felon population represents the largest single group of African American citizens who are barred by law from participating in elections. In 1964, Justice Warren wrote, the right to exercise the franchise in a free and unimpaired manner is preservative of basic and civil political rights. In a democracy, the right to vote is protected from all other rights. It is anti-democratic to hold citizens to account for violating laws and deny them the same ability. Because the right to vote is inalienable, most democratic countries in the world agree no amount of criminal disenfranchisement is accepted. In fact, U.S. criminal disenfranchisement laws are some of the strictest in the world. In an international comparison of felon voting laws among 45 countries, the, the U.S. falls squarely in the most restrictive category. Only four countries have posted these restrictions, U.S., Armenia, Belgium, and Chile. The UN Human Rights Committee has even charged that U.S. disenfranchisement policies are discriminatory and violate international law. One reason to explain why the United States is an international outlier is that mass disenfranchisement in the United States is racially motivated. Felony disenfranchisement was not widely practiced in the early days of the United States, but as Jonathan Pearl, research director, at the Center for Nonviolence and Justice at Drexel University explained, following the ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870, which granted African American men the right to vote, the number of states for felony disenfranchisement laws increased dramatically. In 1850, slightly more than 33% of states had disenfranchisement laws for felony convictions, but by 1870, after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, nearly 75% of those states had enacted such laws, along with literacy tests and poll tax. Disenfranchisement laws were enacted to systematically eliminate African Americans from the electoral process and uphold white power structures. Black political suppression was not an accident or a mistake. It was the central purpose of these laws. The laws continue to have this effect today. African Americans constitute 36% of the overall disenfranchised population and are disenfranchised at four times the rate of non-black citizens. Nationally, one in every 13 black adults is disenfranchised, with those rates reaching as high as 20% in four or more states, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. The predictable result is to disempower the larger community. According to me, Professor Neil Sobol, studies show that more restrict, the more restricted the state's disenfranchised law is, the more significant the reduction in voter turnout by black people not convicted of felony. The disenfranchisement of community members creates a damaging message to others about the legitimacy of democracy and the respect given to their voices. This situation is even worse because of prison during mass. In 44 states across the country, incarcerated Americans are treated as residents of their prison cell for the purposes of creating electoral districts. Although they themselves cannot vote and are likely to return to their home community after serving their term of incarceration, this practice is increases the voting power of predominantly white rural areas where many prisons are located. This practice works in conjunction with post-release disenfranchisement to dilute the voting power of localities where formerly incarcerated people return. Disempowerment has serious consequences. For example, according to a comprehensive study by professors at Florida State and Duke University, criminal disenfranchisement harms the health of black Americans. Findings show that the higher levels of disproportionate black disenfranchisement were associated with worse mental and physical health among black older adults, thus by weakening black Americans' political power to positively affect change in their communities and by exposing them to psychosocial stress, for example, social exclusion, low control, stigma, and unfair treatment. Racialized disenfranchisement likely harms black health. Racialized felony disenfranchisement is associated with worse physical mental health among Black Americans. Significant state level and Black white inequity and disenfranchisement and its links to health underscore the fact that U.S. states are racialized institutional actors that shape population health. Consistent with the growing recognition that social policies and health policies 
and not give laws to dismantle racialized felony disenfranchisement would likely improve the health of Black people and make progress toward achieving health equity. In addition to the health consequences, there are serious consequences in American juries and the justice system writ large. The federal court system selects potential jurors from a list of registered voters. Where does that leave the rest of the community that is not on that list? Essential in the American ideal, justice by judgment of one, a jury of one's peers. How is that possible if jurors are picked from a list that ex Explicitly excludes expellers. 23 states currently disenfranchise 5% or more of their African American adult population, including Georgia, which excluded a 14% of African American voters from juries in 2011. Given the sheer magnitude of estimated numbers of African Americans with felony convictions, it is difficult to imagine that the exclusion of ex felons from jury pools does not have a contributing effect to the persistent underrepresentation of African Americans. And the jury box and the persistent overrepresentation of African Americans in jail. Are you ready for cross examination? Yes. I'm sorry. Let me. Uh, I was just fixing the timer. I apologize. I also would like to note that Shamika is the local neighborhood advisory commissioner for Z seven F O eight, and she's from Southwest DC. Great job, Shamika, on that on that opening argument. And yes, we are going to start cross examination with our next speaker. But before we do, um. From the negative team, we'll have three minutes of cross X, so please remain at the lectern, Shamika. But I would like to also acknowledge uh, Georgetown's team before we introduce their first speaker for cross X. Um, I, I know I noted that Georgetown has a strong team, but four of the five GU debaters in uh, attendance today also qualified for and competed at the national debate tournament this year, the college policy debate equivalent of the NCAA championship, which uh, Jared and Wake Forest are very familiar with after uh, setting an unprecedented run last year with the Triple Crown. So shout out to Wake Forest. But uh, Georgetown uh, has some really great debaters you're about to meet. Adam and Adam Connolly made it to the round of 32. Kumail and Kiernan finished in the Sweet 16. And Kiernan won, was one half of the partnership, ranked number four in the country last year from Georgetown. So the, our next speaker who's going to be offering cross-examination from Georgetown. Shamika, are you ready for three minutes of uh, in questions? If so, then I would like to introduce from the Georgetown Hoyas to do cross-examination, Mr. Adam White. Adam is originally from Shawnee, Kansas, majoring in international politics. His educational goal, not surprisingly in this crowd, is to attend law school. And he thinks that debate matters because it's provided him a forum to hone his research, critical thinking, communication, and advocacy skills, all while encouraging him to learn more about the world than any classroom setting possibly could. Um, well said, Adam. So for three minutes of cross-examination at your first audible remark, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Everybody for cross-examination? Yes. All right. So my first question is, under the affirmative plan, irrespective of the crime that was committed, the person would have the right to vote. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You also mentioned that they would be eligible to vote so long as they are otherwise eligible. I assume this means that they would have to be 18, registered to vote, et cetera. Are there any other qualifications involved? No, we borderline at 18. Got it. You mentioned that voting rights are, quote, unquote, inalienable. It makes sense to me why voting rights are important. Why do you think they are inalienable? Because it is a universal right for those who are citizens to vote. Okay, there are other rights that we might consider inalienable. For instance, people have the inalienable right to pursue happiness. And yet, we place limitations on serial killers' rights to pursue their happiness by killing people. Do you think that some restrictions on inalienable rights are justified in some sort of way? There is no principle line for excluding so called serious offenders. Even terrorists or the worst offenders, even when the most punishments are imposed on convicted individuals, a 
death sentence, life or life sentence without parole. These persons do not generally forfeit their right to citizenship. Democracy means that we allow everyone to have their right, their say, regardless of courage. Okay, you mentioned that there was the, the first part of that. You mentioned that there was no line or principle basis. Why do you think that's the case? <laughs> okay, you mentioned that the voter turnout in black communities in places where black prisoners are disenfranchised is lower. States like Maine have re-enfranchised their um, prisoner populations. Have we seen an increase in voter turnout in those states? I think that's okay. We can, we can move on. My next question is that you mentioned the health consequences of black communities and black prisoners. Just to be clear though, reversing and giving voting rights to prisoners does not reduce the rate of incarceration, the disproportionate sentencing, or access to health care in the prison institutions, correct? Correct. Okay, then how does restoring, restoring voting rights to those populations help with the health consequences given the background effect of all of the other structural disparities that exist in the criminal justice system. We agree that more resources should be spent in criminal justice reform, but that cannot be the reason to take away the universal rights of citizens. And restoring voting rights helps criminal justice reform. As you heard in our constructive disenfranchisement, increased recidivism isolating individuals from society. Studies confirm this. As we cited in our constructive, one study found that states currently disenfranchised are roughly 19% more likely to be rearrested than those related in states to restore the right to vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you both very much. Is everything working properly? But yeah, so you should be able to see the timer a little clearer now. Yeah. I mean, you're young, so you're obviously yeah. clear. Okay. The time. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, reset that. You guys can see the timer? Yeah. So it's great. Thank you. I got it. Okay, so next up, presenting the negative team's first constructive argument for seven to nine minutes. We have, from Georgetown, the gentleman I just prefaced as one of the best debaters in the country. Not that that should influence anyone. We got to hear what he has to say first, right? So he's from Chicago, Illinois. He's studying international security, and his goal is to go into politics to make a difference. DC seems like the right place to do that. Uh, why debate matters to Kiernan? Debate's been the defining activity of his education, pushing him to grapple with a range of issues and perspectives with a degree of depth and open-mindedness that far exceeds a classroom setting. Uh, well said. So for seven to nine minutes, the negative team's first constructive argument, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Kiernan Lawless. The timer's still off the screen. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll start the timer at your first audible remark. Can you see it, Kiernan? Yes, we, we can't see the timer. Is there a digital watch or stopwatch we could someone could put on the lectern or that's fine. I can just leave the watch up here. Uh, okay, I'll cool. Get that. Yep. setting something up. One second. Okay. The question of this debate today is one of pragmatics. The affirmative has defended that while it is abstract, convicted persons should retain the right to vote, but they have not answered the real question, which is whether voting rights will materially improve the conditions of the criminal justice system or result in net worse conditions and harm for people convicted by the same system. Unfortunately, the answer to that question is the latter. Universal rights will ignite a devastating political backlash that results in a new wave of voting restrictions and anti-crime crackdowns, 
both of which will result in an increase of disenfranchisement and violence. In 1987, Terrence Mithy, a professor of criminal justice at the University of Nevada, described the criminal justice system as hydraulic, where it adapts to reforms in some areas by imposing harsher treatment in others. For example, Reagan's judicial discretion laws of the 80s, which lessened criminal sentencing, were then bashed by Republicans in the 2000s and were weaponized by Bush to spearhead mandatory minimum requirements a tool widely recognized by the American Civil Liberties Union as reinforcing racism in sentencing. Furthermore, reforms to police departments' abilities to seize civil assets were used as a guide to expand the rational basis test, which was able to justify countless fines, fees, and penalties for minor crimes to regain the lost funds, all of which disproportionately impacted the impoverished. Today, with the 2024 election on the horizon, parties are looking for leverage against the other, making a reform as expansive as the propositions particularly controversial. Voting rights would immediately elicit a wide opposition from the Republican wing and moderates, forcing the Democrats in power to compensate on other issues, such as enhanced marijuana criminalization, higher mandatory minimums, and more. This is especially salient in the midst of crackdowns on voting rights across the country, with states like Georgia banning the mere act of giving water to people in line to vote. What will be the reaction to an additional 4.4 million more eligible view voters viewed by many politicians as dangerous to society? Some states could use this expansion as an example of the potential tyranny of the majority and demand for the Supreme Court to uphold the independent state legislature theory, which would allow state congresses to unilaterally choose the president and ignore popular will. States could also use the new influx of voters as a justification that they have undermined established districts and amplified their push to gerrymander as a result, undermining the ability for the newly enfranchised to influence electoral reforms. States would certainly use voting rights to amplify concerns over illegal election meta justifying policies that restrict mail-in ballots, impose mandatory voter ID requirements, and remove electronic voting machines. Those reforms are particularly disastrous in today's day and age. There were 35 million mail-in ballots in 2020, and there are 16 million people in the United States who do not possess a government-issued ID, all of which means that the affirmative expansion of voting rights would in fact result in a net decrease in the ability to vote by the general public by restricting them far more than people gain under the affirmative proposal. Remember, long lines in Florida alone contributed to the loss of 200,000 votes in a single election. What happens when people use the plan to justify much larger attacks on voting rights? Be skeptical of any affirmative claim that the power of the collectively enfranchised would force an expansion of voting rights across this country. Prisons could simply refuse to provide convicts with polling stations, arguing that even though they have the right to vote, prisons do not have an obligation to provide them with the capacity to, a defense Georgia has already used to close polling stations. Parole could be narrowed such that most feasible voting stations would rest outside the range granted. Voting rights alone would be a far insufficient shield to the ability of local governments to subvert individual civil liberties. And even if convicted persons could vote, studies have shown that as few as 15% of ex-felons do, which is 40% lower than the general turnout. Studies also conclude that this turnout would have only influenced 1.7% of Senate races across the span of 28 years. Furthermore, formerly convicted people are not single issue voters. They are motivated by a wide variety of factors and there's no guarantee that they would side with one party, especially because states are not required to inform them of their new rights. Now, even if the affirmative wins that there is no trade-off or backlash to granting voting rights, they must also conclusively win that these rights should be granted to all convicts. The resolution today says universal, which means the affirmative must defend those rights for every category. In contrast, we contend that voting rights should be granted to convicts 
except in cases of treason and voter fraud. As in both cases, convicts have done direct harm to the American democratic process and collective interests voting is intended to serve. Nora Delmeter, a professor of law at Washington and Lee University, wrote in 2019 that totalizing the abolition of felon disenfranchisement would preclude the government's ability to selectively deny the franchise for individual crimes that directly attack democracy in the state. Courts ought to disenfranchise felons for crimes, treason, and electoral crimes precisely because of the proportionality of such a penalty. Furthermore, this penalty would send a nationally significant message about the importance of franchisement as a political privilege. American democracy hinges on the good faith participation of its citizens, and in order to preserve and codify the importance of that participation, we must ensure that enfranchisement is not available to those who have chosen to refuse their civic duty. Professor Delminer also contends that exclusions do not have to be lifelong, and therefore do not have to carry the negative societal implications the proposition is concerned with. However, categorical enfranchisement would preclude even temporary disenfranchisement as punishment for crimes such as voter fraud, which would serve as a powerful and proportional deterrent for future potential offenders. Finally, their critique of disenfranchisement breaks down in the cases we isolate. Jeffrey Reinman, a professor of philosophy at American University and noted advocate for felon enfranchisement, stated in 2005 that the restorative benefits of enfranchisement in improving civic virtue and responsibility may not always hold. It is especially true in cases where felons have shown themselves to be especially immoral in those areas. While they may win that it is broadly beneficial to offer the franchise to some felons, selective denial for those who have shown a flagrant lack of moral regard for this very civic virtue it is meant to encourage is necessary. Those who critique disenfranchisement on the grounds of its lack of proportionality similarly fail in applying such arguments against crimes to the state and democracy. Remember, those who committed nonviolent crimes would be exempt, even those who engaged in things like armed robbery, robbery or murder could vote. This punishment is especially reserved for those who deliberately acted to disenfranchise their fellow Americans. The punishment here is a just reward, demonstrating the severity of their crime, likely deterring it in the first place. Thus, selective disenfranchisement offers a more potent remedy to the contemporary problems that plague American democracy. While the affirmative proposal would offer a false sense of novel individual freedom, it would come at a great cost to the integrity of the system that enables freedom altogether. To favor such action would be to trade the rights for the few for the rights of the many. As inviting electoral delegitimization and harm to national interests through malignant political participation limits the freedoms of every citizen. Thus, we must align ourselves with the vision of democracy that selectively uses criminal penalties for the purposes they are meant to serve to ensure the good of society. Excellent. Thank you, Kiernan. And please remain at the lectern as we call up DC's cross-examination speaker. I'd like to introduce from DC for one to three minutes of cross-examination. This next speaker is a chess master, fun fact, from New York City. So Kiernan, I hope you're ready for three minutes of some, uh, some cross-examination from DC's own Mr. Yvonne Lopez. Yvonne? Come over here so they can see me down here. I'll switch over. Yeah, we have it. Thank you. Uh, uh, do I start or do I uh, I'm not sure, but say thank you for you know our great coaches, Sarah, Jackson, Tori. And uh, uh, Gary, <laughs> thank you guys. You know, appreciate you guys. And I'll continue for stepping up. Appreciate you guys for uh, you know, showing me the way. And uh, um, so we, uh, you know, do you believe a person 
who commits a crime can change yes or no? Yes. Yes. Uh, why you should why should the vote why then why then should their right to vote be impeded? Uh, we made two arguments here. The first is that providing universal voting rights will lead to an increase in disenfranchisement. So given the fact that we agree that being able to vote is largely a good thing, this would be less democratic and more violent to the system. Our second argument is that those who deliberately act to disenfranchise their fellow American through the act of treason and federal election interference should not be able then attempt to interfere again in this election. Okay. Can, uh, can, you find, can you provide proof that revoking the right to vote deters crime? Well, this was also an argument made in the first affirmative speech that the right to vote is inalienable and something society largely considers as a not to deter crime. Well, I agree, but that's what I'm getting to here, which is the fact that we all agree that this is a right that citizens consider fundamental likely indicates that they would be upset that it would be able to be taken away from them. Okay. Um, is it fair that 44 states across the country, incarcerated Americans, are treated as residents of their prison cells for the purpose of creating electoral districts? No, but our argument here was that the affirmative reform would allow a new type of redistricting, where states would then say the new influx of voters requires a new line drawing of districts, which would lead to the same types of gerrymandering that you can hear about. So I was saying, in conjunction with the post release disenfranchisement, Eluding the voting power of localities where former incarcerated people would serve these effort? Uh, I would argue that one, the affirmative makes it worse, and two, even if it were not to be fair, there could be other reforms, like simply not counting people who can't vote as residents in the state, which would solve the issue of fairness that you've raised. So, short, so society prioritized reintegration, which, which is facilitated by voting? Well, the argument here is that it would be difficult to facilitate reintegration by voting alone when the affirmative would be used to justify so many other restrictions on voting. Rather, society should focus on a broad other set of ways to integrate people into society after prison. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned the contemporaries of this elective uh, opposes democracy, but uh, we believe that, uh, you know, uh, the right to vote is political. Uh, should we allow the most familiar with the criminal? Should we allow the most familiar with the criminal justice process, most affected by it, participation in reforming the system by giving them a right to vote? Well, a major argument in my speech was giving them a right to vote would not let them change the system. As many times, they have changed less than one percent of elections in any given year, and less than two percent over the span of twenty-eight years. So it is unlikely that enfranchisement would lead to meaning, meaningfully different electoral outcomes. Okay, should America right, be a democracy? Thank you very much. Next up, also from the negative team offering their first rebuttal for the Hoyas, I'd like to introduce our next speaker offering the first negative rebuttal for four to six minutes. This next speaker is from San Jose, California, majoring in international economics and debate matters to this next speaker because it's taught her how to parse through large societal issues and turn her thoughts into well-researched advocacy. Uh, I like that. So let's hear that verbalized. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Georgetown's Nikki Rahman. Nikki? I also cannot see the timer. I have a timer, so I'll do two. Oh, okay. The affirmative's first contention is that to establish exceptions to the franchise is undemocratic and immoral. However, this is incorrect. Voting rights, unlike what they contend them to be, are not absolute, nor should they be. Rather, they are a privilege contingent on the social contract established between members of society and the government that they live under. As Christopher Bennett, professor of philosophy at the University of Sheffield argues in 2016, the rights of free and equal citizens in American society can, by definition, never be considered absolute or fundamental because it is clearly permissible to invade certain individual liberties to prevent broader societal harm. Temporary or permanent disenfranchisement is thus compatible with the moral foundations of democracy, as it exemplifies decision-making that privileges the public interest above that of the individual. Furthermore, the affirmative has agreed with this premise, 
Even under their conception of voting rights, this is still limited to American citizens, for example, and does not extend to people who do not reside within the country. Therefore, it is understandable that there must be some necessary and reasonable limits on rights that even we consider fundamental, and therefore the premise that voting rights can be taken away in no instances does not make sense. Furthermore, the concept of inalienable rights themselves are rather non-existent. We should instead think of rights as extending from civil institutions that we have built, because rights, after all, are only an extension of the democratic institutions that make them possible to begin with. Thus, we contend that crimes that directly contravene those institutions ought be exempted from things like enfranchisement. Furthermore, even if we do not win any of these things, every inalienable right has restrictions on the exercise of said right. As previously mentioned in cross-examination, the fact that all of us have a right to free speech does not mean we can do things like fall to yell fire in a crowded theater. Montana's constitution recognizes the inalienable right to protect property, and yet people are not allowed to petition officers of the state using eminent domain. Similarly here, all people may have an inalienable right to vote, but restrictions placed on the exercise of that right are justifiable and important. Furthermore, the affirmative contends that voting rights that removing voting rights for those who are incarcerated is exceptionally racially discriminatory. However, this does not stand up to scrutiny. Roger Clegg, General Counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity, writes in 2009 that felon disenfranchisement laws are not in fact rooted in the post-Civil War era, nor were they designed to induce racial discrimination. Disenfranchisement rather originated as a component of Greek and Roman law that was then imported into European legal codes and eventually modeled in the United States. Between 1776 and 1821, 11 states passed laws disenfranchising criminals of particular categories. And by the eve of the Civil War, over two dozen states had barred those convicted of serious crimes from voting. In 1861, over 70% of Union states had felon disenfranchisement laws, and by 1868, this extended to 29 states in the entire country. Importantly, all of these laws were established prior to 1870, which is when the affirmative contends that voter disenfranchisement laws originated. The pre-Civil War source of these laws clearly indicates that they could not have been designed to perpetuate discrimination or circumvent reconstruction efforts. The affirmative further argues that disenfranchisement is disproportionately harmful to black citizens. However, this premise mistakes a widespread social ill of racism for a specific flaw with the idea of disenfranchisement in the first place. Clegg writes again in 2016 that the problem of racism and within felon population cannot be considered grounds on which to declare disenfranchisement a biased policy because nothing about its legal mandate implies or even enables the targeting of black and brown Americans. Although systemic racism in this nation has led to exceptionally high rates of conviction and incarceration among those communities, enfranchisement would do nothing to prevent this. Thus, we cannot dismiss disenfranchisement on the grounds of a broad social ill that it has no consequential bearing on. Professor Altman writes in 2005 that denial of voting rights is a drop in the bucket when compared to other legal roadblocks that fell in space. For example, things like the termination of parental rights, denial of public employment, denial of federal assistance, suspension of student loan eligibility, and more, are rather more responsible for much of the racial harm done by the criminal justice system. Furthermore, much of these things, like lengthy sentence terms, excessive incarceration, and inhumane conditions of imprisonment, all contribute far more to the carceral system that the affirmative attempts to break down. The affirmative further contends that things like black voter suppression prove that enfranchisement is important. However, we have a couple of arguments here. First, the enfranchisement offers a quick way to solve those things while still temporarily suspending voting rights for the time period of incarceration. Furthermore, things like prison recidivism, etc., including the statistics that were cited in cross-examination, were more relevant to the idea of re-enfranchising voters. Their statistics are about the importance of the votes of those who have regained the franchise, which is a negative argument and not an affirmative one. Finally, their arguments about prison gerrymandering are an entirely separate issue. The affirmative has contended that it is bad for us to draw lines for ele electoral districts based on prison populations, a premise with which we can agree without ceding the idea that universal enfranchisement is a good idea. Rather, we agree that voting rights and gerrymandering are issues that are broadly important, but think that the negatives counterproposals are better. Finally, the affirmative argues that black health outcomes are worsened by a loss of voting rights. However, this argument is connected to the things that I previously mentioned, the other denials of rights that are endemic to the criminal justice system. These are by no means issues we ought to ignore, but are importantly things that cannot be solved by enfranchisement. Furthermore, things like temporary removals with reintroduction afterwards, in fact, offer a more potent solution to rehabilitation. 
In fact, Mary C. Burt, professor of law at Arizona State University, contends that it is actually better for rehabilitation by a clergyman consideration of the importance of political participation. And therefore, we strongly contend that universal voting rights ought not to be permitted. Thank you. That is time. Thank you very much. And next up to the lectern with the Defense Coalition's first affirmative rebuttal, our next speaker originally hails from Richmond, Virginia. Fun fact about this next debater, she lived in four countries, including the US, France, Mexico, and she's also um, lived on a sailboat in international waters. So well-traveled, uh, hopefully her arguments travel as well. So let's give a warm welcome to DC's first affirmative rebuttal speaker, four to six minutes, Ms. Eleanor Tory Hoppy. Eleanor? Our current policy disenfranchises nearly 6 million people, some of them for misdemeanors, that cannot be sustained. Disenfranchisement violates the fundamental right to vote, which cannot be taken away even if a crime is serious. As we've already explained, democratic government is legitimate only if everyone subject to the law has a say in creating those laws. Professor Corey Brickmetter of Brown University further explained, Telling prisoners they cannot vote is premised on the idea that convicts undergo some sort of temporary, quote, civic death, unquote, a suspension of normal rights of citizens while they are behind bars. But the federal government has made strides away from the notion that civic death has created or has occurred over the past century. The Supreme Court decided that prisoners cannot have their citizenship stripped as a means of punishment for crime. As Justice Earl Warren wrote in the 1958 case, Dredd versus Dulles, Quote, citizenship is not a right that expires upon this behavior. End quote. If prisoners remain citizens and retain their civic status throughout their sentences, then it follows that prisoners should enjoy the most basic of their civil rights, the right to cast a ballot. Disenfranchising then creates a class of people still subject to the laws of the United States. They were, after all, punished under those laws, but without a vote is <clears throat> in the way they're governed, not unlike taxation without representation. As a result, according to Professor Jeffrey Ryman, a proposal to disenfranchise serious felonies still rests on an overestimation of how morally different criminals are from law-abiding people, which ignores the issues of how bias and injustice contribute to determining who our felons are. For these reasons, the counterclaim is inherently flawed. The counterclaim is also arbitrary. They say dis disenfranchisement is okay punishment for certain crimes. But they apply that punishment only to some crimes without any good reason. For example, the counterclaim could disenfranchise a burglar who used a weapon to steal to feed his family, but not for his made off, who stole $64 billion. It also disenfranchises people who commit election fraud, but not people who commit hate crimes. There is no principled line for excluding so called serious offenses from the basic right of citizenship. According to Mark Bauer, executive director of the Sentencing Project, the more fundamental concern relates to the use of disenfranchisement as a punishment for crime, even when the most severe punishments are imposed on convicted individuals, a death sentence, or a life without parole. These persons do not generally forfeit their rights to citizenship. Depriving people of the rights of citizenship based on bad character as defined by a felony conviction would be a very subjective process. Democracy means that we allow everyone to have their say, regardless of character. Particularly in the era of mass incarceration, which has affected millions of Americans directly and many more indirectly, we need to incorporate the ideas and perspectives of those affected into the national discussion. Excluding them would be akin to suggesting that any person who had had bad hospital experience should be permitted to weigh in on health care policy. Finally, permanent disenfranchisement is not justified because every person is capable of change and deserves a chance of rehabilitation. According to Jason Saul, quote, in Harvard's Black Letter Law Journal, the subversive voting theory has a common problem justifying permanent disenfranchisement. Namely, they are both premised on the idea that a criminal's corruption is permanent. Flaws in one's virtue may disappear over time. Defining someone solely by the worst actions of their distant past provides an inadequate picture of the person's ethics. 
Accordingly, it is arbitrary, short sighted, and against fundamental democratic principles to disenfranchise certain individuals based on certain crimes. Vulnerable people have rights too. Many voters are uninformed or maybe vulnerable, like people in nursing homes, but they still keep their fundamental right to vote. Incarcerated people should not be treated any worse. Fears about vulnerable prisoners are also disproven by experience. Prisoners now vote in Maine, Vermont, and Washington, D.C., and the negative has absolutely no evidence of abuse or, or, or vulnerability. If the other side were really concerned about conditions in prisons, they would support giving prisoners a voice through voting so that conditions can actually improve. According to Professor Corey, Corey Breitschneider of Brown University in 2016, prisoners need the vote to serve as the natural defenders of their own interests. But in defending their own interests, prisoners could substantially improve, improve the prison system itself. And this would be a common sense way to help them identify the needed changes, allowing them to vote. In fact, if the other side wants criminal justice reform, allowing prisoners to vote is a great way to ensure such reform. My op opponents also argue that disenfranchisement is a justified punishment as retaliation for the person's crime as, it, as a practical matter. The threat of disenfranchisement will make people less inclined to commit crimes. But other democratic countries seeking punishment don't speak to these levels. In fact, the United States is one of the only democratic countries that does not allow prisoners to vote while they are incarcerated. As stated by the ACLU in a well-researched comparative report from Title I of one out of the world, looking at an analysis of felony disenfranchisement in the U.S., disenfranchisement is simply on a completely different scale. No other democratic country denies as many people the right to vote. Okay, I guess Tori's arguments do travel well. Excellent job, Tori. And now we've actually reached the halfway point of our debate and leading us to open the second round by presenting the negative team's second constructive argument for six to eight minutes. Our next uh, debater from the Georgetown Hoyas team Mr. Kumail Saeda, who's originally from Bethesda, Maryland, studying culture and politics. And fun fact about Camille, he has a dog named Iris. Camille, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. The affirmative arguments may seem emotionally compelling, but they fail to withstand the test of scrutiny. A justice advocated upon false premises is no justice at all. That's just another word for jive. And the proposition's case is mired in many such contradictions. Our opposition to today's resolution is based on two simple premises. First, trade-offs as well as political backlash. And second, the inapplicability of universal voting rights to those convicted of treason or voter fraud. We will demonstrate beyond doubt that these costs are so significant as to outweigh any of the benefits of the affirmative plan. And I'll address both contentions in this speech. But prior to delving into those specifics, I would like to address the core premise of the affirmative's arguments. That is the idea of certain rights as inalienable and voting being an example of that. This is simply not true. It relies on the premise that you are born with the right to vote, which is false. Adam and Eve weren't told by God that thou has the right to vote, Rather, these are contingent rights that are born from institutions and decided by them, and so they can be manipulated as such. It is a privilege that should be respected and, and preserved. Second, there are limits to even inalienable rights. Just like you have the right to speak doesn't mean that you have the right to say fire in the middle of a crowded movie theater, which demonstrates that these are not, even if it is an inalienable right, that does not mean that it should be, uh, that uh, voting must be preserved at all costs. Now, to go on to our contentions proper. Our first contention here is the question of trading. All of you are well aware that any political decision in here is a cost or a trade-off. In the context of universal voting, the costs outweigh the benefits. A policy of universal voting will be replaced with far more insidious systems that will exacerbate the very harms and issues described by the affirmative speakers. We must remember that the prison system, as our evidence indicates, is hydraulic. What that means is it adapts to supposed reforms by imposing even harsher treatments. 
These costs are untenable morally and dubious politically during an election year where the stakes are so high that small political missteps could be exploited by either party to secure the election. That creates an incentive structure to be able to exploit the policy in malicious ways. But this has been empirically proven. Consider how Reagan's judicial discretion laws were used by Bush to spearhead mandatory minimum sentencing, or how common police reforms are taken as sufficient cause to be able to expand racial profiling. Yes, the affirmative has identified a set of salient political issues in the criminal justice system, in our society writ large, but resolve those harms may not. Instead, the affirmative proposal risks reinvigorating the very systems of racial profiling they criticize. They may have identified a symptom, but in the world of the affirmative, the disease still festers. A world of universal voter reform is a world of crackdown, and we cannot and should not trust that the same system, which perpetuates things like gerrymandering of districts or racial profiling, et cetera, denying water at polling stations in Georgia, will implement this policy in good faith. This is naivete at its finest. The consequences far outweigh the benefit. Expanding voting rights in this manner will be the basis for heightened civil conflict, as states will certainly be able to plead the Supreme Court to uphold independent state legislatures in, uh, in this context. This would be a certain cause for a new wave of policing. Things like voter manipulation, unforeseen consequences. Kieran, in the first speech, provided many such examples in the context of prisons of what this could look like. The incarcerated may be granted a right to vote, but states like Georgia or Florida could easily refuse to implement those policies effectively, making it hard to, making voting hard to access, closing off polling stations, and a litany of other potential consequences that would end up denying the right to vote, therefore violating the question of inalienability that the affirmative thinks is valuable in the first place. Now, the affirmative might make some arguments about expanding the right to vote, increasing civic engagement. This is also not true. We have read statistics in our first speech which describe that even if, uh, even, even if the incarcerated could vote, few as 15% of ex-felons uh, ex have voted, and it doesn't make a difference in the context of turnout. In fact, it would only shift in 1.7% of Senate races over 28 years, which means that the question of the benefits do not outweigh the costs. Now, our second premise is that universal solutions to complex problems are simply out of fashion. The affirmative has demonstrated why voting rights are important, but not why they need to be universal. And remember, the affirmative's burden in this debate is to prove to you that rights must be held universally in every single context. Our contention in this debate is that uh, the right should be restricted in the particular case of treason and voter fraud. I would like to make this clear. Our argument is not so extreme as to say that those convicted of treason ought to be denied all rights forever, but there should be accountability in cases where an individual poses a significant threat to democratic principles that voting rights rely upon. Exclusions need not be lifelong either. Our alternative model would necessitate that those who exploit the democratic system be temporarily denied the very privilege that they sought to deny others to. It is a logical consequence of the action of exploiting the democratic system. Only our proposal sends a signal to the world that, that America prioritizes electoral integrity above all else. This resolves all the affirmative's concerns. We agree the current system is flawed. We agree that we should think about how to expand voting rights, but we disagree that voting rights should be given to the very individuals who deliberately undermine that system. Uh, this resolves every claim the affirmative has made, in particular the racial violence of the current system. We all saw what happened on January 6th. Those committing treason and election fraud are primarily white folks making a uh, sort of making vote, voting, et cetera, harder for people of color and working against their best interests. Do we seriously think that it's a good idea to give voting rights immediately to those individuals who attempted to storm the White House and be able to exploit our own elections? It doesn't make sense logically or politically. Now, the affirmative argues that, vote, uh, that rights are only legitimate if everyone has a say. This is a conflation. Everyone having a say does not mean everyone has to have the ability to vote. Actions like public debates, et cetera, are expressing a voice within the context of a democracy. And everyone having a voice does not mean that everyone should vote. Even though I think my little brother is a very smart guy, I don't think that a 15-year-old should be granted the right to vote right now, which demonstrates that contingent exclusions are sound even within a democratic system. 
They say that our counter plan is arbitrary. It is not arbitrary. It is proportional. If you're a soccer player and keep breaking the rules and get punished with a red card, that is proportionate to the offense. Similarly, if you attempt to exploit the voting system, the very electoral system that you are given the right to participate in, it makes sense to contingently for a certain amount of time be denied that right to vote because you have exploited it and attempted to turn the system against itself, which demonstrates that their example about the burglar is simply not our argument. Now, they say that uh, a permanent sort of uh, punishment is not justified. Our counter advocacy is not a permanent punishment, but rather in, uh, because we have clarified and read evidence which indicates that this does not have to be a, a lifelong punishment. The question of vulnerability is resolved because we do think everyone should have a voice, but we think that the process of granting individuals a voice should not come at the expense of the benefit of democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. And next up, for to present the affirmative teams, second constructive argument for six to eight minutes. Our next speaker is originally from Northwest DC. And a fun fact about this next debater, he loves to write poetry. So hopefully we get some of that flow with this constructive. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. C Harold Cunningham of the Defense Coalition team. Now, our opponent that gave various arguments is why individuals should not be allowed to vote. But I ask them, what can deny a person the right to vote contribute to it? But I ask them, what good does denying a person the right to participate in society really serve? How can we stand as a country that is founded on the belief that all persons are created equal and given ineligible rights and then remove those rights without justification? Shouldn't we allow those most affected by the criminal justice system process to participate in the ability to shape and reform our laws? This country has, throughout its history, fought to shape and reform the Constitution by means of evolving understanding that what is morally right. We have the opportunity to do so again today, ladies and gentlemen, to ensure that when we say all persons are created equal and, and entitled to ineligible rights, we stand by those values. Ex-felons constitute a large group of people in the United States and their exclusion from the political process is undemocratic and is racist. In addition to those arguments, disenfranchisement also increases the recidivism and decreases civic engagement. First, the status quo worsens recidivism. Disenfranchisement hinders rather than promote integration for formerly incarcerated people back into the community. By denying formerly incarcerated people the ability to directly participate in the political process of voting, disenfranchisement isolate rather than integrate those we enter in society. As current legislated in 2023 Guardian article, cutting people off from society by revoking their right to vote doesn't benefit anyone. People touched the criminal justice legal system because they felt disconnected from society. And so disconnected them even further doesn't make any of us safer. Overall, democracy drives when everyone is included, and that includes people who are currently incarcerated. In fact, isolation increases the likelihood of individuals recommitting crime. If a person is denied the most fundamental right to participate in society, that person has no reason to follow the rules of that society. Why would a person follow the laws if he or she is not able to be a part of that society? This argument is not just common sense. Numbers and data confirm that disenfranchisement increased recidivism. For example, one study analyst data collected by the Department of Justice showed that was a significant association between state disenfranchisement laws and recidivism. A study analyzed the differences across the state laws and attempted to correlate the effects of state laws and recidivism, found that individuals who are released in states that permanently disenfranchised are 19% more likely to be rearrested than those in states that restore the franchise most released. Another study found that approximately 16% of non-voting former felons were re-arrested compared to just 5% of voting felons. The opposite has been proven true. Indeed, when the individual feels that the larger community sees them as more than the offense they committed, a new sense of connection 
is created. Voting, civic engagement, and political participation also has been found to positively correlate the lower rates of recidivism and rehabilitation. As recognized by the Vermont Department of Correction, correctional recidivism is influenced by individual reintegration and the community and the community willingness to support the rehabilitation, among other factors. While seemingly minor, each small connection creates a large sense of community, which all individuals need to thrive, especially those in vulnerable and often singled out classes like prisoners. Another according to 2019 study, there, there is a notable correlation between political participation rate of rearrest, incarceration, and recidivism among former arrestees. About 27% of non voters were rearrested related to just 12% of voters. Voting appears to be a part of a appears to be a part of a practice of pro-social behavior that is linked to law abidingness that the right to vote remains the most powerful symbol of stakeholding in our democracy. In contrast, the criminal justice system, which is focused on punishment, introduces openness to long-term risk that increases the chances of repeating the same problematic behavior. Effective rehabilitation has shown to decrease recidivism by 10 to 25%. While there is clearly a harm in denying a person the right to vote, there is no harm in allowing a person the right to vote. While we choose to incarcerate, to punish individuals, to deter others, and keep our community and sometimes the incarcerated individuals safe from harm, an act of voting by a prisoner does not harm the community. Indeed, enfranchising convicted felons will do something that not only for them, but also for us. By inviting the felon and ex-felon into the political discussion and full voting member, we will begin to learn just how normal most criminals are. Mm -hmm. Allowing felons to vote offers the, the possibility of instilling, stripping civic virtue in them. On the other hand, by opening ourselves to fellow citizens who have gone afoul of the law by allowing ourselves to see their normalcy and to hear from them, well, the way society looks at them being large, our own social sympathy and social knowledge, and we exercise a civic virtue, a virtue of charity. In addition, by granting felons and ex-felons the right to self-government to which they are entitled as human beings, we exercise the strength in ourselves, the civic virtue of justice. And franchising felons can make us all better citizens. In short, this evidence confirms that disenfranchisement is a policy that creates and harm, which far outweighs its benefit, serving only to further alienate an isolated group of individuals at a time when they are trying to reintegrate back into society. So if a so if as a, so if as established, there is no evidence that disenfranchised and formerly presently incarcerated citizens aid in rehabilitation or deterrence. I ask my opponents, why remove the right to vote from a selected group of people, which what social good does it serve, if not deterrence or reducing recidivism? I submit there is no social good it serves, and therefore we cannot afford the impact on the market that comes from a large number of people we have intentionally chosen to disenfranchise without justification. As a fellow, my past is my past. Why can't my future just be my future? And in closing, the right to vote is brought to prisoners. The right, the rate of recidivism or the mass to be due. The chains of disenfranchisement are broken. The 5.3 million with criminal records who are disenfranchised will be enfranchised. The one out of 44 adults who are disenfranchised due to current and previous felony convictions will be enfranchised. The more than 2.2 million people who have completed their sentences who are disenfranchised across the country will be enfranchised. The 75% who have been released from prison who are disenfranchised will be enfranchised. And the approximately 3 million incarcerated persons who are disenfranchised will be enfranchised, including the 2.2 million. That's time. Thank you, Harold. Great job. Great job. Next up for our final round of rebuttals, 
for three to five minutes each. We'll have we'll hear one more round of rebuttals from each team. Also from the affirmative team from the Defense Coalition, our second affirmative rebuttal is coming from an individual who is also from D.C., from the Southeast D.C., and a fun fact, this next debater loves to cook. So I hope these arguments are, are hot and spicy. So let's hear our, our first, second affirmative rebuttal from Mr. Corday Fitzhugh. Corday? <laughs> Our opponents argue that resources should not focus on improving, I mean, should focus on improving prison conditions for other areas. To be clear, there is no trade off. We can guarantee the right to vote to all incarcerated people and for all larger reforms to prisons. As we stated in our constructive, one similar study showed that among former arrestees, about 27% of the non voters were rearrested versus 12% of voters. And as we also explained in our first constructive, disenfranchisement laws take away the voice of the people who are the most affected by the criminal justice system. That only affects people with criminal convictions, but also disempowers the broader community because it sends the message that some people don't get a say in how laws are created. An additional counter argument might come from the left rather than the right wing of the political spectrum. Those on the left might charge that the creation of a prison constituency might take a focus on the problems of mass incarceration itself, including the racial and other injustices of our current criminal justice system, but arguments for empowering the prison constituency are a structural way of addressing the concerns we imprison too many people. A prison constituency will not revoke unjust laws overnight, but if we can allow those we are most affected by them, and those and their sometimes unjust application will speak out against them. Finally, the most importantly voting the most importantly Voting is a right. You should not take away someone's fundamental right based on my opponent's hope that some other criminal justice reform will magically happen overnight. Overall, we believe the counter plan is wrong. Georgetown opposes that disenfranchisement laws are made to rehabilitate and don't lead to recidivism. My opponent does not appreciate the fact that enfranchisement reduces the rate of recidivism. Using the data obtained from the Department of Justice study of the topic, Hadar Adaran, University of California Hastings law professor, concluded that the right to vote for formerly incarcerated people creates a stronger connection to their community and makes them less likely to recidivism. Also, a 2004 study published in the Columbia Human Rights Law Review found consistent differences between voters and non-voters in rates of, subs of sub subsequent arrest, incarceration, and self-reported behavior. That study found about 27% of non-voters were rearrested versus 12% of voters. My opponent argued that disenfranchisement is a justified punishment as rehabilitation for the person's crime and as a practical matter. The threat of disenfranchisement may make people less inclined to commit crimes, but other democratic countries seeking punishment laws do not stoop to this level. The U.S. is one of the only democratic countries that does not allow prisoners to vote while they are incarcerated. As stated by the ACLU in a well-researched comparative report entitled, Out of Step with the World, the same study also said that granting the right to vote would arguably serve a safety as well as civic purpose. As studies have indicated that recidivism rates are half, law, half as a law among res restoring <laughs> citizens the right to vote. There are many examples of former prisoners who have made a difference in the political world, such as Nelson Mandela, former president of South America, Marion Berry, our former, our former mayor of DC, and our very own AMC commissioner for DOC, uh, and ending with Joel Costello, who was recently elected as a board member. Not everybody is so lucky in the United States, especially when we are able to show our contribution to our country after our convictions. Finally, the statistics confirm that disenfranchisement not only does, does not deter, but actually increases recidivism. They made a point that administrative costs are too high, but we simply believe that, that is not true. My opponent suggests that cost should not be a deterrent factor in deciding who gets to participate in our democracy. First, it will cost the same amount, if not less, to be able to vote across those spaces. Correction facilities are already structured to enable security and have hired workers to run booths, provide materials, and oversee ballots. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, PA, and Montgomery County, Maryland, all counties 
that have worked to ensure inmates have access to registration materials and absentee ballots with cost issue, without cost issues at all. Most importantly, cost should not hinder the fact that we are incarcerated persons are still human and have this fundamental constitutional right to vote. My opponents say that people with convictions will help democratic parties. This is factually wrong and it's not a more way to desire who gets to vote. Whether or not giving every citizen the right to vote favors a certain size should be irrelevant. The right to vote comes from being a citizen who is subject to the law. No other than the group is forbidden to vote based on what party the government thinks that they might vote for. Prisoners should not be able and should not be treated any differently. Outstanding. I, I, I think you lived up to uh, your chef hobby there. That was uh, that was great. Thank you. Finally, the last rebuttal coming from the Georgetown Hoyas. Also for three to five minutes, the negative team's second rebuttal. This this speaker is someone who originally hails from Mount Pleasant, Texas. They're majoring in international politics and minoring in psychology with an educational goal to join the intelligence committee. You should probably talk to Sarah before you leave. Um, and why debate matters to our next debater. Debate matters because in many ways, but first and foremost, she is grateful for the community and the meaningful relationship she's gained through the activity of debate. So please give a warm NPDL welcome to Georgetown's Connolly Cowan. Again, I think I can speak for all of Georgetown, and I thank you all for having us here. This has been an incredible experience the last two weeks. So, thank you to everyone who's organized it, and I really appreciate it. The question of this debate is not whether voting rights for convicts should be allowed or even expanded. We have all agreed that the current system is unjust and unsustainable. But the relevant question is whether those rights should be universal. The answer to the question of the affirmative, uh, the affirmative is asked, is that the social good of creating an exception for those who have committed treason or election fraud is that that exception sends a pivotal signal in the wake of Russian election meddling in January 6th, in which people who were upset with the outcome of the election stormed the Capitol in protest. That signal sends to other countries that the U.S. prioritizes election integrity our democracy is under attack, and their clear, consistent signal that treason and election fraud will not be tolerated is essential. The importance of this signal is something the affirmative has agreed to, as they have consistently compared the United States to other democracies. That says that the, the signal the United States sends to these other democracies is one that is important. So what would it say for the United States to not punish or care about election fraud? The line that is drawn by our counterproposal is principled. It is a proportionate response to the crime of sabotaging an election. Felons who have directly tried to attack the integrity of our democratic system should not have access to that very same system. This does not deny all rights forever, but rather a proportionate right that fits the crime at hand. That says if someone has committed election fraud against the electoral system, they should have their right and access to that same system taken away. This is not arbitrary punishment, but rather direct and proportionate accountability. Importantly, this can also be temporary. Our proposal states that judges should be required to dictate the amount of time in which voters will be disenfranchised and express those mandates in the sentencing that is handed down, meaning it is a temporary lapse in enfranchisement, which would send a pivotal signal to other countries. Now, importantly and separately, all of the affirmative rejections to this proposal do not stand. First, the assertion that voting rights are inalienable is one, not correct. This is an assertion that has never been explained or unpacked by the affirmative team. Adam and Eve not march to the polls every year because it's not something that stems from the fact that we exist in the first place, but rather our voting rights come from the democratic systems we've created at hand, meaning they cannot be something that is inalienable because instead they are created by the institutions that we have formed in the first place. Second, inevitable restrictions on inalienable rights already exist. Herein gave the example of a serial killer not having the inalienable right to pursue happiness if it means killing other people, or of the inability to yell fire in a crowded theater, or allowing Kumi's brother to vote because he's not yet 18. All of these are restrictions that already exist on rights that are inalienable, which means it is perfectly coherent to draw a restriction 
the people who have messed with the integrity of our democratic system at its core should not be allowed state access to that system. Secondly, the affirmative rejects because of arguments about recidivism. First, those are broadly solved by our counter proposal, as people who have committed other crimes would not lose their voting rights in the first place. But secondly, the evidence they have, they have provided demonstrates some very interesting correlations, but not necessarily causality. People who are already pro-social are more likely to vote, which means they are also more likely to not re-offend, which demonstrates that there is an interesting causality between the two, but not correlation between the two, but not causality. Finally, arguments about racial discrimination are broadly solved by our counter-proposal, as people would still have the right to vote unless they had committed election fraud. It's also not solved by voting rights alone, as those things do not get to the core root of the system and the root of structural racial inequality. But finally, they don't explain the foundation of enfranchisement, as it comes from Greek law and predates the 15th Amendment. Now, importantly, even if you were to take many of the affirmative arguments at face value, you should be incredibly skeptical that imposing an expansion in voting rights would solve all of their harm, because instead it would result in far more insidious consequences due to trade-offs. Remember, we have won the argument that the criminal justice system is hydraulic, meaning that reforms in some places necessarily push trade-offs in others. We've seen this empirically with Reagan's sentence reform leading to mandatory minimums under the Bush administration. And in election year in particular, these kinds of trade-offs would be more acute as Democrats would be forced to compromise. States would do things like gerrymander in response to a new prison constituency. They would restrict mailing ballots or require voter ID, all of which makes disenfranchisement more likely than the status quo. Prisons would refuse to offer polling or narrow parole such that it was impossible for convicts to vote, all of which means that the affirmative proposal would not solve their harm. Finally, they have not responded to our statistic that only 16% of former felons actually exercise their right to vote, meaning the scope of affirmative solvency is incredibly limited. Thank you very much, Connolly. Now, both teams will present closing remarks for 90 seconds apiece. And we're going to begin with the affirmatives team making their closing remarks for 90 seconds. A fun fact about this next debater, he's a twin. So hopefully he brings that, that twice the energy to this speech. He's also originally from Northwestern D.C., so please give a warm welcome to the Defense Coalition's closing speaker, Mr. Christopher Raheem Green. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Defense Coalition, we thank you all for coming. Today you have heard many arguments on why individuals that are incarcerated should have the ability to vote. But as a society, who do we decide whether who gets the right to vote and the privilege of so safety? America previously questioned whether women and African Americans should have the right to vote and also be a part of our political community. Denying any American his or her right to vote because of the gender or race was unjust. So is denying the citizen a right because they committed a crime. As a society that's built on innovation for a better future to come from generations of will, disenfranchisement has no room in our society. My peers have given many reasons why universal voting is important to the democratic process. We also agree that voting is a privilege that can be forfeited. Additionally, our past as a country was written when the states and the founding fathers wrote the Constitution got better, not perfect. I will end with this. Treat your neighbors well in spite of their shortcomings that they have, just as you would like for them to be treated in spite of the shortcomings that you have. Your past does not define you, nor can you see your future. Thank you. Thank you, Raheem. Now we will hear the final word on today's debate from the negative team from the Georgetown Hoyas. One more time, please welcome to the lectern, Mr. Adam White. What 
rising questions surrounding electoral tampering in January 6, it is essential for the United States to send a strong signal that electoral integrity is of the utmost importance to the democratic functioning of this country. The affirmative has made a persuasive case to restore the voting rights of most individuals in the country. However, they have failed to explain and convince you that we should restore the voting rights of those who committed electoral fraud because they themselves attempted to sabotage the system of one person, one vote that they have tried to uphold. Using disenfranchisement as an express, deliberate, and time-limited form of accountability only in the case of a small number of election fraud cases is the best of both worlds. It restores the foundation of democracy based on one person, one vote, with the sole exception of those who chose to attack the fundamental underpinning of this country. Second, it reverses the racist history of disenfranchisement by only limiting the offense to the small number of electoral fraudsters who, frankly, are overwhelmingly white. Third, it encourages rehabilitation and reintegration to society by allowing and encouraging the same forms of civic participation that they have said are important. The right to vote is not nearly the privilege, and it should reflect those who have adequately and in good faith engaged with the political system. Importantly, only the negative proposal sends a signal to the entire world that America is prioritizing electoral integrity and the rights of its citizens, reigniting faith and confidence in the American beacon for global democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And honestly, thank you to both teams. Obviously, that concludes the speaking portion of the debate. And now we're going to turn it over to our judging panel to tabulate all of those scores. I'm, I'm sure you gave them a lot of math to, to calculate. So while they're actually tabulating those scores and our chief judge will announce the winner, you will the winner will be receiving this trophy. Um, so that will be announced shortly. And while we wait on those scores to be tabulated, as we always do, we don't like dead air here at the NPDL. We wanna keep the conversation going. And now that the competitive side of, of the speaking is out of the way, I would like to begin by asking at least one representative from each team to voluntarily take the lectern and spend a few moments to reflect on what you just accomplished together. Because I don't think that the folks watching at home who aren't there to experience what you're experiencing in person understand the magnitude of what you both collaboratively achieved today and transforming that space into something really special. So I just like to hear from both of you, uh, you know, some representatives from each team, if if uh, someone would volunteer to to share what this experience has meant to them. Anybody from Georgetown or DC like to offer some thoughts about this experience? And I thank my competitors, Georgetown, and thank my fellow kids for coming here and actually telling us about their side. I believe affirmatively that we all should vote equally, and I feel like no matter what crime or anything you did, that you should vote. And yeah, with all this that we're doing is rehabilitating us and making us better. So. The university right to vote is what we should do. That's all I got. <laughs> I like it. I like it. He's standing, standing by the position, rightly so. Hello, everyone. How is everybody here? Uh, I just want to thank our whole staff for giving y'all from the beginning on everything. Right? It was a uh, very, very good audience. But, um, Look outside. Okay? <laughs> well, I, um, on a serious note, yeah, um, on a serious note, though, everyone in this room, no matter what color you are, no matter what color you're in, we all have shortcomings. We all have, whether those shortcomings is huge or small, no one in this room is perfect. Anybody that's in this room perfect right now, you are the Christ, and you are here right now. That's very scary. So that, with that being said, I believe that um, no right, whether it's a voting right, let's take the voting right out of the picture. Any right that we have as a human being, 
woman, man, child, black, white, other. I believe that no right should be taken from anybody. That's kind of like saying that um, you work at an ice cream bar and you love ice cream, but they won't let you serve the ice cream at the ice cream parlor. Why work there? Let's take that same thing and put it in ordinance with your citizen, which is the worker at the ice cream bar. Ice cream bar is the world that we should have to vote in. And with us not being able to vote, why are we a part of the world? We all like ice cream, right? <laughs> hey, so you know, take that into consideration. Next time there'll be any anyone gets together and say, should we have the right to vote or anything else? Thank you. Wait, before, before Mario leaves, the design on the shirt has was drawn by Mario himself. He's an artist. <laughs> yeah. I definitely want to acknowledge that Mario and all and the rest of your teammates as well. Not everyone got a chance to take the lectern. So I, I definitely want to acknowledge the entire DC cohort um, by name, but I'll, I'll allow you to speak, sir. Go right ahead. I hope you don't mind. I was inspired about this about two nights ago. It'll be a, a quick, a quick one. I, <clears throat> I was rifling through my 72 square foot home and found some light reading. The, uh, it was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Most people don't understand its importance because most people don't experience not having rights. Just go back to women could not vote. Because there are women, they could not vote. That's crazy. Just like it's crazy to not let 6 million Americans vote today. Civil rights, uh, civil rights was, um, was about desegregation and everything, including bathrooms. Remember bathrooms having whites only and there are no other bathrooms around? Crazy. The, the Civil Rights 1964 Act. Number two was discrimination. Number three, desegregation of public facilities. Number four, desegregation of public education. Number seven, equal employment opportunity. Number one was the right to vote. That was the most important thing, number one. Love, not hate. Love, not hate. We need to activate love to smother out the flames of hate. Only love is strong enough, only powerful enough to win over hate. We have three classes, maybe now four, the upper, the middle, and the lower classes, and now the slave class as well. That's what we're creating when we separate out and disenfranchise billions of our citizens. We are literally doing the exact opposite of what this country is supposed to be doing. We are hatefully exiling millions and telling them they do not belong. What would you do if this happened to you? You killed three people drinking and driving like a guy who might that I know. He wasn't mine. He was 20. I'll tell you. I'll tell you some of the disenfranchisement might go to a, a disenfranchised guy might go to a mall and then open up fire and kill people and hurt people he does not even know because he feels so separated. I know him too. He was here, this jail. Disenfranchisement is the worst sense of the country and our citizens good name if they care about so. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to add uh, some acknowledgement here before we transition to any more speakers while the judges are still tallying. And I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, Mario and Sarah acknowledge that Mario designed the team's DC team's logo. Uh, and but we also have a number of other members of the team, the DC team that just founded here this year. So. So, and we're, we're happy to have representation from both the, the men's and women's facilities. So we're able to have this co-ed team. So Mario White, Takara Michelin, Jeremiah Poindexter, Antonio Payne, Paul Camby, Jarvis Jackson Bay, Lynn Long, Nikita Walker, Ronald Dorsey, and Marquinta Robinson. Just want to acknowledge all of your hard work over the past 12 weeks, because even though you didn't have active speaking roles today, we, we know how hard you work to help your teammates get prepared and how much you worked on this issue as well. 
So it was a true team effort. Thank you all for trusting our process. Georgetown as well. Thank you for adapting to our format and uh, helping us collaboratively bring DC back to Washington. Um, all due respect to our Congress. I think you guys did a better job than than they tend to do here today on, on a very important uh, subject and timely with voting coming up. So I will shut up now. You have something to say, sir. Let's keep the conversation going. Away from today, so I'm just recovering the message. He said, Allow our past to be the past and let our future to be our future. When I'm done, I appreciate everybody for coming and thank you. This is the greatest thing. <laughs> so I just wanted to say very briefly, as a reflection on this, first, echoing everyone else, thank you to everyone. Uh, for allowing this to happen. Thank you for debating us. You all have powerful and awesome speakers. And, you know, I can say that they did for, you know, a couple of years now at Georgetown. And we have a bunch of pieces competing against different teams. But for me personally, this is one of the more enjoyable debate experiences I've had uh, in college. And I really appreciate this, this even happening. You know, a lot of our debates, we end up talking about uh, you know, really important issues, but not really the lives, don't get to have conversations with uh, those who are affected by the issues that we discuss. So I thought that this was really important, you know, for us as people um, to learn from you and also have conversations with you about an issue that's really poignant for us. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you all for, for making this happen. I appreciate it. Thank you, Camille. Is anyone else from Georgetown like to talk about the experience or any any of your coaches? Uh, I know the judges are still busy tallying, so we have time for a couple more speakers. If if anyone would like to come and, and address or share their thoughts on on this this beautiful what I like to uh, we we at the NPL refer to as social diplomacy because it is a very rare form of uh, of community we're able to create in these spaces. So we're very grateful for all of you. Um, taking advantage of these opportunities that that we're able to create for folks to have a voice on these issues and have these discussions. So uh, I, I will let uh, Connolly uh, have the floor. Yeah, I, I want to echo a lot of what you said. Thank you all for having us here. I think, uh, honestly, Camille said it best. It's really easy for all of us to debate issues kind of in the abstract, but it's Exceedingly rare that we talk to people who are directly impacted by those issues. And I think that it's so important and something so unique about this experience is to really understand that these are people's real lives at stake and these are the real things that affect them. So I want to thank you all for participating in this, for sharing your perspective. I think this was, yeah, obviously one of the most meaningful debate experiences I've had in eight plus years of debating now. So thank you all. Hey, Connolly, can I ask you a question? Well, uh, oh, sorry. I was curious if anyone from Georgetown's team had to really have some of their preconceived notions or views challenged while researching this topic, or even as you've got to interact with folks here. and Camille have already said, we learned a lot from this experience. It is one of the most meaningful things for us to take debate outside of what it is to us and bring it to other people who are learning it and understand this research process as more collective than we previously assumed it to be. And while many of us are used to considering both sides of any policy proposals, given that that's the nature of debate, it is not often that we are forced to or incentivized to grapple with the very direct and human experiences that comprise policy issues. And as Connolly and Camille have both said very well, it's essential for policy discussions that that takes place. And as debaters, we often think a lot about going into careers like politics where we're going to shape the future. And as people who are aspiring to do those things, I think all of us have found 
incredible value in being able to have a conversation like this, you can have a research over these things and then bring it to a discussion where those issues are super meaningful to everyone in the room. That I think is something I wish more policymakers would do. And I hope that as all of us aspire to careers that are at least somewhat tangentially related to those things, if not very directly applicable, that we all take forward with us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Floor is yours. Go right ahead. Sorry. And I, I want to um, thank you, Daniel, because uh, when we first met, man, you really opened my eyes and home. And, uh, and I know speaking to some of the other members on our team, when you came in, how you touched us, how we can see where somebody who was formerly incarcerated come out and come right back into the facility and give back. Because that's what it's all about, giving back, not forgetting where you came from and not being afraid to reach back. And Daniel, that's what you did. And man, we appreciate you. I appreciate you. And I know my team appreciates you so much, man. And I definitely want to, our coaches, each and every one of y'all, sir, Tori, and I need to do the name. Of you. Aaron. Aaron. So, I'm saying, the way they humanized us, I mean, made us feel like we was family. I'm talking about each and every meeting that we had. They made us, man, they would sit right there with us, man. I mean, made you feel so comfortable, made you feel the okay. We got some people fighting for us. We got some people believing in us. And I don't think that they really understand how they motivated all of us to participate in what we're doing today. Yeah. Some of us fell back. It could have been any one of us making any one of these speeches up here, like Mario uh, uh, could have been making my speech. We all had backup, and all our backups were just as strong as each and every one of us here. And we supported each other because of the team encouraged us to do that. You understand what I'm saying? And the stuff that they did, and, um, you know, sir, it's just worth can't really describe how much she really meant to us. And the thing that she do, her joyfulness, y'all see how she hop around. She just hop around like she ain't in no friend, man. This woman is something. Y'all just get to meet her. I first met her with her when her and Professor Snow were together. And she'll be sitting from in a chair to yoga style on the table. She just felt <laughs> this was their home. She come right like she was her home. And that's how she felt. Man, I want to say this to the Georgetown students that came in here. As soon as y'all came in here, y'all immediately started conversation with us. Y'all didn't go off to a side like, you know, discouraged type of stuff. Y'all mingled with us and never meant for that. And I talked to a few of y'all, and we had some good, inspiring conversations. And I told y'all, you know, I'm older, and I've been incarcerated the last 31 years. But it's the youth, it's y'all. It got to lead us. You understand what I'm saying? It's the youth on our team. And I tell my brothers in this prison every time, it's the youth that got to lead. And we know for the women, sure, y'all the backbone of our community, especially our sisters in here. We got to have more programs really highlighted. But this sister right here is the representation of what we are, the strength. This sister is the ABC. She not only represents the people in this prison, she represents the female uh, uh, shelter out of society and the seven poor district out here, right? And man, we got the utmost respect. And even though me and her ran against each other, I was speaking so highly of this sister because it's y'all women who got to really, really support, man. Y'all are first people. And we got to be, man, we got to come together, man, and make a change. And I want to thank y'all for giving me this opportunity. Man, I love y'all, man. And um, may we continue the uh, progress. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. What I, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Very well said. I think the scores are in. Sarah, you want to you wanna make the, the closing remarks so the judges, I believe, are ready to weigh in. Feel free. No, please. Sarah, feel feel free to make some uh, share your thoughts, please. Um, just for wanted to stand up for the coaches on this side, and obviously you watch this as well. But um, I've worked on a ton of teams, and I have never seen such camaraderie and dedication. And it is by far the best part of my week each week. You guys come prepared, you come excited, you come with creative out of.
the box ideas, people with very little resources writing by their handwritten notes, pages and pages. Lopez as a chess master has like highlights and cross and everything. And I wish y'all could have heard all of the stuff that all of them have to say. They just completely crush it. And we are so proud of you guys and so proud to be part of your team and so excited for, for all of you. And I'm very grateful for the Georgetown team too. I hope you do this, but I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. And again, I appreciate I appreciate everyone. And just so you know, everyone who participated in today's event will be invited to a debrief so we can continue the, the conversation that started here today. But for now, I'd like to turn it over to the judges. I, I don't know if any of them would like to share some thoughts as well. And certainly Jared, I believe, will announce the winner when he's ready. So I will I will just turn the the floor over to the judges now. Well, I have the decision, but I certainly don't want to cut off any conversation. So if there's another one of the judges that wants to unmute themselves and say anything, then I'm, I'm happy to wait. Uh, but I feel like the anticipation has been building and people are excited. So maybe I'll take a little bit of my executive privilege as the chief judge in this situation, which is hilarious given we have an actual judge as a part of the judge. But I will say uh, this was an outstanding debate. I had the chance to judge the first inaugural debate that took place between MIT and um, some people in Maine. And it was a phenomenal debate. And the debates are only getting better, which is a sign that a testament to the work that Daniel's doing, that every one of the educators is doing, and to the brilliant intellectuals of everyone that participated. Another testament to that is how razor thin close the judges are. This is a three to two decision, meaning out of the five judges, it is a three to two decision, which demonstrates that it is a coin flip in the college debate community away from going one way or the other. In the end, this debate was won on a three to two decision by Georgetown. Georgetown emerges victorious with three of the judges and uh, the Defense Coalition had two of the judges. So a round of applause for an amazing debate that took place. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to turn the floor over to any of the judges that want to elaborate. Uh, but I just want to quickly say, what a phenomenal debate. Thank you all for letting me be a part of it. Um, and I, I hope that you all know that win or lose, the risk that comes with standing and delivering pays a reward in cultivating that voice and winning future arguments, whether internally, interpersonally, or with the policy realm. So thank you all for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Jared. And I will just add that it is still a remarkable, I understand scores are scores, but it is a remarkable accomplishment. I, I hope for anyone who doesn't understand what these two teams just did, as Jared said, on a very high uh, degree of difficulty on this policy topic, and both teams did such a good job, but it's, it's one of those situations where there are no losers. And I know that may sound corny, but you just took, we just, again, the NPDL showed you that there are no inferior minds when it comes to incarcerated intellectuals. And they just stood against one of the top policy debate teams in America. And, you know, Georgetown escapes with a win. And congratulations to Georgetown. No disrespect whatsoever. I, I am just really wanting to elevate the skill level of incarcerated intellectuals because that's what we do is we highlight what folks have somehow forgotten about is that we are all human and we can be we can disagree without being disagreeable. And so we're 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 going to continue to highlight that DC this is just the beginning. We're going to be back for the fall season and we hope we can continue this local relationship with Georgetown. So with that, uh our next NPDL event is going to be May 2nd and that's going to be with our international team, University of Binghamton is going to be facing our team from Finland, Kapoli, and that's going to be uh, on the issue of open prisons as well. So it'll be another uh, reform-based topic we hope you'll tune into. And with that said, uh, do any of the judges have any closing remarks? I'm going to jump in because I don't, I have to run to a next meeting. I apologize about that. This has been an unbelievable experience. I was knocked out by all the advocates. This was a great debate. Uh, the organization, the research you did, all of the sources you were citing to and the that led to some really strong reasoning. Um, but I want to particularly give some shout outs to uh, the the affirmative team for some of the ways in which you brought heart 
and yourselves. And I think, and very, that is, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, been a practicing lawyer for a long time. And I work now at a law school Been working at law schools for 20 years. I've worked with our advocates here on campus uh, on our barristers council team. It's the advocate who can actually make an argument that affects those who are hearing it that will win the day. And you made some arguments today that affected me. Um, Shamika, you had so many nice, you had multiple arguments and they were so nicely researched and I, you really hammered home on the international, the way, the way we're standing out as a country compared to other countries. And that was really impressive to me. I really loved it. Uh, when um, I'm trying to read her, Ivan, <laughs> when you stood up and just said, "Can a person change?" <laughs> I that's that that knocked it out for me. I love that. Um, when uh, <laughs> I, I'm Eleanor, you had a really nice. You found it. I think you found this in the research, but you honed right in on this idea of. What and when I'm in prison, it's a civic death. I <laughs> that all these this beautiful imagery really brought all of your arguments to life. Um, and Harold, my my past is my past. Why can't my future be my future? I think everybody was knocked out at that moment during the debate. Um, and Corday, I loved all your examples of former prisoners who've gone on to contribute so much to our society. Um, I know I'm forgetting a lot of people, but, and I have to rush, but that what you pulled together in what sounds to me like just a few months is outstanding. And I, I hope you'll all be thinking about Georgetown law someday. I'll be lo looking forward to seeing an application maybe anyway. <laughs> so thank you to all of you who put this program together. It's fantastic. And uh, thank you to everyone who participated today. There was some really outstanding advocacy today. I, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining and supporting the work, Maura. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, did you have any, do you want to have the final work, uh, final word, excuse me, as uh, from your perspective I, as a judge? I mean, I can. I, um, I thought both teams did amazing work. Um, and so the, the first thing that I want to say is, um, I coach novice debaters all the time. My I, my entire team almost is made up of kids who come into college debate with zero high school debate experience. And um, for this being your first outing, I am blown away. You all did amazing work. Um, I think uh, keeping up with the exchange of ideas as they're happening, not getting overwhelmed when um, kind of plot twists happen, um, not being just sort of in, incapable of seeing the forest for the trees is such an amazing uh, skill that newer debaters or people who have not had a ton of experience with debate um, sometimes aren't able to engage in in their first couple of outings. And so I think the fact that you all, the, the fact that this debate was as close as it was and the fact that you all were making the kind of arguments that you were making throughout the debate is, I, I, I just, I keep saying amazing, but it just, I mean, it really is. Uh, and so I think that that was awesome. Um, I super agree um, with Maura, who just spoke about the sort of emotional and the the sort of ethos component. Um, for me, I think the, I, I am <laughs> boo one of the people who voted for Georgetown. Um, but I think that for me, um, if you all had grappled a little bit more and and made those ethos arguments about the counter plan that they're making, which is about um, generally re-enfranchising voters, but sort of having this separate category of people who committed offenses against the state or offenses against democracy. And so their arguments then as to why that is proportional, it doesn't, to use the sort of like debatey parlance, it doesn't link to a lot of your social death arguments or your um, or your uh, like interpersonal arguments because their argument, the argument that they're making is the vast majority of those people are white and are actually actively attempting to disenfranchise voters of color. And so that, um, so it kind of like internal link turns your argument, I guess. Um, and so I think if you all had said, um, you know, 
the best way to encourage those people to use democracy and access democracy appropriately in the future is to continue to allow them access to democracy. But that's what a good democracy does. Right. A good democracy doesn't say like, oh, no, you did it wrong or you did it bad. Right. A good democracy says everyone should have access to this. Everyone voices matter, even when you have done a thing that we disagree with vis-a-vis -vis the execution of a democracy. And so I think if that had happened, then um, this debate would have gone the other way, because I super duper agree that you all are the ones out there with the heart and the experience and the ethos. And I. I have already asked, um, I've talked to John Katsoulis and asked if my debaters can debate you all in the fall because we're over at the Naval Academy. So it's a short trip and we would love to come out. But now I'm like kind of afraid. <laughs> Do we want to debate you in the fall? Um, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it, time will tell. But we thank you so much for the feedback, Danielle, because again, uh, th this is a new team and I'm so proud of you guys in DC. And I'm so great grateful to Georgetown. I hope we can continue these connections. But for our DC team, I just want to add that my thoughts are this. You guys are, I, I was, I've been in your shoes, right? I learned prison debate in prison and it helped me elevate and become um, a much better thinker and not just speaker, but like I had to understand what I was trying to navigate. And so with debate, it, it's such a, a vehicle uh, for upward mobility on many levels. And I, I appreciate that you all trusted us in our process because none of you had debate experience and you just, I hope prove to yourselves, like you just, you just more than held your own against one of the top teams in America. You should be super proud of yourselves. We're super proud of you. And we can't wait to re revisit uh, this in the fall. And we look forward to having a debrief conversation next week. So you'll all be invited to that. Thank you all so much. And uh, yeah, next week to tune in for our international debate, it'll be posted on the website. Okay. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.